If you have your Bibles, turn with me to John chapter 1. We are going to get in. I hope you're, are you ready to get into God's Word today? I hope so. <laughs> um, oh my goodness. We had, we had a great time in first service, uh, worshiping the Lord. Who got a bag of coffee last week? A couple of people got a bag of coffee. We just gave, a, we got, got rid of all the rest of them today. So thank you for supporting our missionaries. Uh, it was uh, we, we absolutely love them. I don't know about you, but um, this... <laughs> I think God has some big things in store. And I think oftentimes we get so busy with things that are going on that, that we, we, we miss the things that God is really doing right here in our lives. And... Sometimes we need to take that time and we need to pause and we need to reflect on who God is and what he has in store for us. Now, this message that we're getting into today, as we get into John chapter 1, I am very, very excited about this. This is probably one of, what I think, one of the most important topics and one of the most important core values in the church. And we're going to unpack this today, um, but this message that we're going to be unpacking it has gotten confused over the years, it has gotten twisted around into something that people don't really understand or, or they see it in a very negative light. And what we're talking about, and maybe you got a hint of it from, from the, the video, uh, was this message of evangelism, sharing our faith. And many times when people hear that word, they get very nervous about it. But what I love about what's going on around our nation in many churches is a, a, a bringing back to God's word, a bringing back to some very foundational biblical principles. And, and, and this idea, this concept of evangelism is incredibly important. In fact, Jesus tells us that one of the, one of the last things he tells us to do is to go into all the world, preach the gospel, make disciples. And then, uh, especially one of his last acts that he tells the people to do is in the book of Acts, and he says, go and wait. For the power that you will receive to, in order to do that, in order to be witnesses. But this, this concept of evangelism has been turned around. This idea of sharing our faith and our culture now uh, portrays it as a very bad thing. They call it proselytizing. And, and they, they make that sound really bad. But, but we are instructed at a very basic level by Jesus to do this. And unfortunately, it's been done in some weird ways. Um, has anybody heard of Club Three Degrees? It was that Christian club that was down in Minneapolis for a number of years. Anybody heard of that? Or gone there? One. Pastor Andrew, are you really the only one besides me? Wow. I guess it has been closed for a while, my understanding. But uh, I went to a, a Five Iron Frenzy concert while I was at Bible College down at Club Three Degrees. And uh, while we're standing in line, we were literally wrapped around the block uh, down in downtown Minneapolis waiting to get into this concert. And while we're standing out there and slowly making our way towards the gate, there's some people standing across the street with bullhorns yelling uh, with everything they had how terrible we are and how we were going to hell. Has anybody ever encountered somebody like that? Uh, maybe just a couple of people. Uh, that did not do anything good for Jesus. Nobody... Uh, standing in line, suddenly was like, oh man, I'm so thankful that there's people across the street condemning me and hating on me. Maybe I should become a Christian. That's, that, that wasn't an effective way of sharing, and yet many of you have seen it, or maybe you've seen it in the shows, the guy standing on the soapbox yelling to a crowd. Not usually very effective. Maybe somebody can know, uh, can connect with that, but usually not. Usually it actually does the opposite. It's counterproductive. Or Maybe you've heard this statement before when it comes to, to sharing their faith. Somebody is so heavenly minded, they're no earthly good. Have you heard that before? A couple people? Is it, or is it just really a quiet group today? Because uh, maybe, maybe a quiet group. That's okay. Uh, I, I have heard that. In fact, I think I've even said that before. Uh, but this idea that we are so, uh, so stuck in Christian circles and, and stuck in certain ways of sharing our faith that we really can't engage with people in a practical level with what we have to say. And I've heard people, heard people say this, like, brother, listen here, brother, 
I am washed in the blood. I am born again. I am sanctified. I am redeemed. And I am not going to hell like you are. You think that's an effective way to share your faith with somebody and invite them to church? Not an effective way. If somebody invited me to a church uh, when, when they shared that way, I would not go there. <laughs> Just saying. Uh, so not, not a very good way to share. But evangelism, this is, this is what I love. I heard this a while back. A very basic understanding of what evangelism is. Evangelism is, te- is one beggar telling another beggar where to find food. Amen? When I realize who Jesus is and what he means to me, I should have such an excitement to share that with other people, not because of uh, something special I am, but because there's hope, there's life, there's joy that Jesus offers. And I should be getting excited about that. So ultimately, evangelism is is taking what I have a joy for, an excitement for, and sharing it with other people that I care about. Uh, and, and people will come to, come to church, or they'll, they, you'll be at, at work, and, and they're just, they'll have this idea, well, you're just here to convert me. You're here to change my mind and make me become just like you. Uh, that's, not what it is about, that's not what it's about in any way. In fact, I love using this illustration in regards to, um, to restaurants. Uh, does anybody here, you know, you have your favorite place to eat out, right? For me, I love Pizza Ranch, okay? I love going to, anybody else on board with that? Loves Pizza Ranch? You love going in there, and, and I'll, I'll usually hold off on the pizza until like the, at least the second or third plate, right? Because I'm stacking up on the fried chicken and the mashed potatoes and the gravy and the butter biscuits. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Oh, that sounds so good. Dipping that biscuit in those mashed potatoes and gravy. And anybody else want Pizza Ranch now? (laughs) Right? It's good stuff. I love eating that food. And if I'm passionate about it, guess what I'm going to do? I'm going to tell you about it. Like, want to come eat Pizza Ranch with me? Right? And I've, uh, in, in doing that, I've never heard a friend of mine whine when I invite them to Pizza Ranch. Oh, you're just trying to get me to go to a restaurant. Nobody's ever whined about that. Nobody's ever looked at it from that perspective and, and said, said, I'm trying to just convince them to go to a restaurant. Like when we share our faith. Or, or new movies. Who likes going to theaters and catching movies? You, can, you know, they're fun to watch. I went uh, Inside Out. Remember that movie? Inside Out, that cartoon thing about inside that little girl's brain, right? I love that movie. It was so cute and so insightful. And I have invited people to do that. Hey, want to come see Inside Out? Well, you're just trying to get me to a movie theater. Nobody's ever said that, right? When you're passionate about something, you care about something, you, we should tell other people about it. In fact, uh, Scripture, when you read through the Bible, I don't think that we as Christians have an option in this. I think Jesus is quite clear in telling us that we as Christians need to do this. We have a responsibility to share our faith. In fact, the core value uh, that we want to talk about today According to the Bible, we understand that found people find people. Everybody say that with me. Found people find people. And maybe you've heard this before. We are not the first church to come up with this. This is very much a biblical principle here. Uh, And maybe if you're from a, a church background, this can actually be hard to hear. Because according to the Bible, it's impossible for some people to say that they're a for someone to say that they're a follower of Jesus and not be concerned about others who are far from Christ. If you love Jesus, you will be excited about sharing Jesus with other people. And of course, our culture doesn't want you to share. Our culture wants you to shut up and not open your mouth about God, right? They don't want you to say anything, but we need to. We have responsibility uh, it, it's not an option for people who are truly followers of Jesus to keep their mouth shut about how much Jesus loves others. In fact, it gives me chills. It may, almost makes me sick when I hear people say, well, we don't really want our church to grow. We just want to love whoever we have and not get any more. That makes me sick to my stomach when I hear that. Because we, and, and as a church, we are not here to reach people so that we can grow a church. Okay, we are here to reach people and build God's kingdom and have people set free from, from the sins and addictions that are in their lives, right? 
We are here to do that, and as a result, we expect that church is going to grow, and we want to make room for more people. That's why there's empty seats around you right now, because there's people that need to know Jesus. And it's not all about coming to church, but the church is important to Jesus. He established it, and it's this place where we can come together, and we can worship Jesus together today, and get you excited to go out for the rest of the week to worship Jesus at home, and at school, and at work. But when we refuse to share our faith with other people, when we refuse to tell other people about the love that Jesus has for us, we're literally saying, I like Jesus, but other people who aren't like me can go to hell. And that's a very serious deal. We have a responsibility. So there's a couple questions I want you to ask yourself and to think, be thinking about today, but uh, we're not going to get through it all. Okay, this, this message that we're starting today, we're only going to get through two of the points. The rest we're going to finish in two weeks. Uh, so there, there'll be a kind of a continuation to this one. But the first what question I want you to ask yourself is when. If you're taking notes, write that in. When. When did Jesus find me? When did Jesus meet me? So we read this in John chapter 1. If you have your Bible, so we said turn to cha- John chapter 1. And starting in verse 43, and we're just going to read through um, this, this segment, uh, through 46. It says, The next day Jesus went to go to Galilee, and he found Philip. And he said to him, Follow me. Now Philip was from Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter. And Philip found Nathanael and said to him, We have found him whom Moses in the law, as well as the prophets wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Nathanael said to him, can any good thing come out of Nazareth? Philip said to him, come and see. Heavenly Father, I pray that your word would speak truth to our lives. That you'd help us to unpack this a little bit and see how we can apply this before we leave today. Amen. So, backing up to verse 43, who found Philip? Pretty simple answer. Who found Philip? Jesus did. Okay, oftentimes when you're in church and the pastor asks something, what's the answer? Jesus, okay, so, and that's the right answer this time. So Jesus found Philip. Why did Philip not find Jesus? Because Philip wasn't looking for Jesus. He wasn't looking for him. He didn't know that he, he, he didn't even know that he was supposed to be looking for him. And I've heard people say, well, I just need to find myself. Have you ever heard anybody ever say that before? I need to, I need to step back and I just need to, I need to find myself. I have never met anybody who found themselves. Okay? I've never been, you know, you go to Walmart, and, and you go in, and you, and you get a bag of Cheetos, and you go and get a bag of underwear, and you go get your oil changed, because you can do all that at Walmart, right? I mean, Walmart's pretty diverse like that. And, and you get all that stuff, and then you go to the cash register, and you're carrying your stuff, and you go up, and you, and you see a person in front of you, and there you are. Dude, I found me, right? No, nobody's ever done that before, where they found themselves, especially at Walmart, uh, nothing against Walmart, wonderful place. You can achieve a lot there. Uh, but you won't find yourself standing at a cash register, right? Or, or people say, well, I just, I, I found God. You know, I was doing this and I found God. No, no you didn't. You can't, you, you can't do that. Because you were never looking for him at the get-go. Now, maybe you are. Maybe you're at a point in your life now where you're looking for God. But it's not of your own doing. This is because God sought you out. God found you, and he began through his Holy Spirit to do a work in your heart to draw you to him. In fact, we read in, in Romans chapter 3, uh, verses 10 and 12, it says, As it is written, there is no, there's none righteous, no, not one. There is no one who understands. There is no one who seeks after God. You can underline that one. No one who seeks after God. They have all turned aside. Together they have become worthless. There is no one who does good, not one. On our own, we are not capable of finding ourselves. On our own, we're not capable of finding God. We need God's help. And this is what's powerful about this message that we have. Some of you here, you know, you've known since you were young that you have had done a lot of bad things in life. Anybody here that would say, I have messed up in life. I've done some bad stuff, right? And some of you know that you were bad since you were a kid, Right? You were so bad when you were a kid. You're in second grade, and you're trying to smoke Crayola, right? And you're dealing sugar to other second graders, weren't you? Right? You're like, hey, 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 I got something for you here. 
A dollar, I'll give you one of these, right? You're giving out suckers and whatever it might be. I mean, you, you, were, you were working the system at second grade. And some of you are like, hey, that's my kid. Pastor, will you pray for me? So <laughs> some of us, we know that we've been messed up for quite a long time. Uh, but some, pe- some of the, the best people today that need to know Jesus are people sitting right in the church. And if you, they, they, they've grown up in the church. They've always been a part of the church. They were practically uh, born in the nursery, and they've been raised their whole life. They were, they were baptized in the church. They were dedicated in the church. First communion in the church. Confirmation in the church. All, all these different things that we go through, right? And we have all these different things. But then if you were to ask them, hey, do you know Jesus? Has Jesus found you? Do you have a relationship with him? And if you were to die today, would you go to heaven? Many of them would have to stop and say, I, you know, I don't know. I don't know if I have a relationship with him. I know I've, I've been in church all my life, so I think I've just always been a Christian. And I would push back on that a little bit. Um, because if you ask a person, you walk up to a married person and you ask them, uh, are you married? No, no married person in their right mind should pause and say, hmm, let me think about that. I don't know if I'm married or not. Marriage is one of those things you know if you are or aren't, don't you, right? Um, and, or I've never walked up to a married, pers- uh, mar- married couple and asked them, well, when did you get married? And they just look at each other and they say, you know, we've just always been married. No married couple's going to say that, are they? Unless they're smoking something, okay? That's kind of weird. You, you know, you got to get something checked. Okay, you, there's a point in your life where you say, oh my goodness, I met this amazing person. Let me tell you about them. I love them so much I married them, right? There's a point in your life where you meet that person or just somebody that you love, this great friend. Oh my goodness, I've got this amazing friend. And let me just tell you about them, right? So there, we can look back and when did you meet Jesus? Not when you were confirmed or baptized, Okay? Or when you were scared out of hell. Okay? Because um, anybody ever gone to the Hell's Gates and, or Heaven's Gates and Hell's Flames? One of those kind of tour things they use in churches to scare people. Anybody ever been to one of those? No? Really? I guess it's been a while since they happened, huh? I know Eagle Ben just did one like last year. You go into a church and they have all these different rooms set up at different state, car accidents, abortion clinics, all this stuff, and you tour it and by the end there's heaven and there's hell and you have to decide which one you're going to go to. A lot of people, go, they get saved and they pray a prayer because they don't want to be hauled off by the demons into that other room, right? Man, you guys need to get out. And go to one of those one of these times, okay? Uh, so, but many people, they'll choose heaven because they just don't want to go to the, the, the demon side. You know, I can scare a person into getting saved. You know that, right? I, I can make somebody get saved. And I was talking about this in first service, how uh, my kids, I could, I could make them get saved. We could be sitting up in, in prayer at, in, in their bedroom at night and praying with them and say, listen here, kids. Did you know that there's a heaven and a hell? And it's a scary place and you don't want to go there. Because if you go there, they have demons there. And I could have it all cued with Mel to jump out of a closet in a demon costume and just start screaming at the kids, Right? And as soon as she jumps out, I light up a blowtorch and say, this is what hell's like, kids. I could scare them to pray the sinner's prayer. Now, do my kids, if they do that, have a relationship with Jesus? Did Jesus find them? No, but they'll probably go find the bathroom. That'll scare them, right? Salvation is a genuine relationship when you meet Jesus. And you get to know him. And he takes the burden of sin and he begins to help you walk out a life where you're not tied to whatever identity you have outside of Jesus. And it begins to set you free and, and, to, and to completely change things in your life. A follower of Jesus is to grow to be like Jesus in every way, a little bit, every single day, looking more and, and more. Not just looking at Jesus, but living like Jesus. There's a big, big difference. And when God's grace finds you, it motivates you to find others. When God's grace finds you, it motivates you to find others. And I was sitting and talking with a teenager one day, and, and they were just bawling. Oh, I don't, I, I, mean, I feel so bad. I've done this and this and this wrong, and I can't live up to it. I want to know God, but I can't live up to the rules. I can't do all that. 
I was sitting there with them, and they were just bawling. I'm like, I can't live up to it either. I can't do all that, all these rules that have been established. But I know that I can, I can walk in a relationship with my Savior. And I can walk in His grace and His mercy. And that is a powerful message. We're not here to just follow a bunch of rules. We're here to walk in relationship with Jesus. And that's a beautiful message to share. And the world needs to know that. The, prop, the reason a lot of people aren't passionate about Jesus, though, is because they never really met him. They met rules. They met r- religion. They met tradition and a whole bunch of emotions they have to go through. But they haven't met Jesus. Have you met my Jesus and what he can do in your life? And when you do that, you get excited about it. I'm going to have Jim come up and share a little bit. Uh, Jim is one of those guys that loves sharing his faith. In fact, to the point where almost, he almost gets himself in trouble at places. <laughs> but that's okay. Um, just work right over top of that. There you go. So Jim's going to share for a little bit here. Um, I've been saved uh, for 45 years. I met the Lord when I was 19 years old. Um, I was not really uh, looking for Jesus at that time, but uh, he uh, spoke to me at a, at a friend's place where uh, um, I'm, uh, later on Christmas Eve, 1971, I accepted him into my life. And the first thing that I wanted to do after I accepted him, this new life, his spirit came in me and changed me. And I wanted to share this with with all my friends and relatives. So I started doing that. My friends, uh, my best friend Joe, I shared with, and uh, he totally rejected it. And that, that really bothered me. And, uh, but then I didn't stop. I, I, thought, I found the pearl of great price. I had to tell people about Jesus. So in the middle, middle of Minneapolis, I found a, 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 a Native American guy that was um, uh, basically drunk, and I started sharing Jesus with him. And uh, he, he started really, really crying. And then when he started doing that, I was kind of like this guy you saw in the video. Uh, uh, I kind of got spooked, and I just thought, well, he's crying. I don't want to deal with that issue. So uh, I just kind of backed away. And then uh, later, I did have a few friends that came to the Lord uh, uh, when I shared with them. I want you to know that. Not, not everybody rejected, and nor was I afraid. But there was one instance in my early life. I was 21, and I worked in a meat department. I've worked in meat all my life, uh, meat management. And uh, there was a guy that lugged beef into our uh, store. And he was a big burly guy, and uh, uh, I was rather small at that time. And uh, uh, I, uh, the Holy Spirit spoke to me and said, uh, go and tell him about me. And I said, uh, Lord, um, have you seen him? You know, he's a big burly guy, lugging quarters of beef that were 200 pounds. And uh, I could get a fist in my face if I said the wrong thing. And... Uh, <laughs> Uh, he said, go and do it anyhow. And I didn't do it that. I disobeyed that week. And then the next week, he came in again, and the Holy Spirit said, speak to him about me. And I thought about it during that week, and I thought, no. And at that moment, I said, no, no, I can't do it, God. I know he's going to deck me if I say anything about Jesus. Well, it just so happened, this is not good just so happened about a week later uh, he was killed instantly in a in an accident with a meat truck and after that I learned a lesson now God forgives us okay let me make that very very clear you might not have obeyed him somewhere but that doesn't mean your life is over it's a the Lord uh, used that and to this day it's a burning desire in my heart. I don't care if they put a face, fist in my face, whatever. I don't care what you have to say. And at Walmart, I've had management tell me, Jim, you shouldn't be talking about um, religion. I don't care. I'm talking about a relationship. If you've got a problem with it, take it up with God. I'm going to do it unless you haul me out the doors. And, and I'll continue doing it. And I, I don't get any 
feedback from that anymore after that. But the thing is, is <laughs> there's a whole lot of people out there that need Jesus. And I'm excited about sharing. Even I'm 65 years old, I haven't shut up. <laughs> nor will I shut up. Because this is the truth. Everybody's looking for truth. And this is truth. Jesus is the truth. He is absolute truth. This book that we have is absolute truth. I stake my life upon it, and you can stake your life upon it. This is serious business. We have a commission. Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every, it says creature. I don't know if there's creatures that we preach, but people. The thing is, what an honor to do that for Jesus, because he's given us himself, the, the reality and richness of a new life in him. Don't be quiet. Don't be quiet. Please don't be quiet. I'm 65 years old. I don't want to be quiet. I have more now to talk about than I ever have in my life. So you ones that uh, have been Christians for, for a while, don't shut your mouth. Witness for him. Amen. <clears throat> Thank you, Jim, for sharing. Um, so what, I need a couple of volunteers to come up and help me because I have something I want to give to everybody today. So if I could get a couple of volunteers, some teens, or even, even just everybody on the front row, for all that matter. Um, we want to get these things out into your hands, at least eight people. Um, just kind of give at least two per person uh, and a pink uh, post-it. So if some of you would head over to this side and some over to that side, yeah, come on over to this side over here and start getting those out. So this is a card that we've made up because we firmly believe that there are people you know that don't know Jesus. Anybody, if you, can you think of anybody right off the top of your head, somebody that doesn't go to church anywhere and needs to know God? Raise your hand if you know somebody. At, at, like one, at least one person. Put your hand up high. Okay, keep your hand up if you could probably name two or three or four. You, most of you could probably name a dozen people or more right now that need to know God, can't you? So if we're giving you two cards, you should have, we should have no problem giving these things out. Because the, the second point that I want you to get in your notes here, um, one is what you need to understand when you came to know Jesus, when, when Jesus found you, and then understand that God, Jesus has a who for you to find. He has a who for you to go out and reach. And elite, So if we have any extras of these, we'll, we'll put them on the back. If you want to grab more, I think we'll have some, a different style of them arriving by next week. But this could change the way you see community, your faith, and yourself. God does that. God changes us. Uh, so the pink post-it is for you to think about and pray about who would God put on your heart to share your faith with. Now, maybe this isn't your regular church home. Okay, you don't have to use this card and you can cross out the back or just say, hey, you know, you can check this one out, but I actually go to this church. I don't care if people come to this church or another church. Okay, we are here to build God's kingdom, which is not just Verndale Family Life Church. There's the big church. And, and, and if we do our job right as a church, we will fill up other churches. Amen? Alliance churches, other Assembly of God churches. Uh, you just, I'm not even going to go into a list of them. Uh, I don't care about denomination. I care if a church is going to preach the Bible and teach God's word. I am not wrapped up in what, what kind of denomination we are. Do we allow the Holy Spirit to move? Do we worship a living God? Do we acknowledge that Jesus is the Son of God, is God himself? Do we acknowledge those things? And we tell people about what God does and how he loves them. Uh, so we have this responsibility to do this. So pray about it. I believe that God has at least two people for every person in this room that he would put on your heart to invite to church with you. Not just, hey, you should go check out the first service because I go to the second one. Uh, don't do that. Come on, right? Hey, I go to the second service. Would you come and join me? Oh, oh you got something going on in the afternoon? Well, I'll go to the first service if that helps you. You know, be willing to accommodate because most people will go to church if they're personally invited by somebody they know. 
but usually they're uncomfortable stepping into an unfamiliar place. Did you ever, when you, remember when you first walked into the doors of this place, did you feel a little uncomfortable? Yeah? We do, right? So, but when somebody else is reading you at the door, like, hey, come on in, come sit with me, takes all the pressure off, doesn't it? You feel so much more comfortable. Remember that we're not just here to have a little holy huddle. There's people that are lost and dying and need to hear about the good news of Jesus. We are the ones that have the responsibility. Jesus tells us to do that. You know, I don't know about you, but I love coffee. Anybody else love coffee? Yep. I, okay, let's change that a little bit. I don't know about you, but I love caffeine, okay? I don't care if I get it from coffee or pop, okay? And I, when I drink coffee, I like it strong, right? And I like it to where it kicks you because if I'm drinking coffee or if I'm drinking pop, I'm doing it to get messed up, right? I need, a, I need to get a good kick in the rear to get going for the day. And I, I remember one time when I was down in Roseville that... Uh, I, I was a youth pastor down there. I was driving semi at night, so I go to work at 10 o'clock on Saturday night, get off at 8 in the morning, go to church by 9, and work with the youth ministry there. And I was exhausted. I was on about my fourth cup of coffee, cup of coffee, and, and I, was, I was getting pretty wired, but I knew I was tired, so I figured I'd chase it with one of those energy drinks, right? But it wasn't a regular energy drink. It was a NOS. Have you ever had a NOS? It was like a four times the caffeine of all other energy drinks, Okay. That thing was insane. I had so many jitters and I was talking faster than an auctioneer in church that day. It was insane. And I had caffeine literally coming out my eyeballs. It was way too much caffeine that day. That was a mistake. Okay? But one of the things I want you to get, as a Christian, when you're sharing your faith, you are not doing it on your own power. Okay? As a Christian, you are a new creation in Christ Jesus. And his word tells us That as Christians, we have two things in us. One, we have the mind of Christ. We have the mind of Christ. And it begins to transform our mind and shape us so that we think different. That every time you see somebody, every time you look in their eyes, you should see that there's an eternity hanging in the balance. And they're not somebody to just brush off. Well, they don't look like me. They, they, They don't behave like me. They don't smell like me. Whatever it might be, you know. Don't just brush them off. There's an eternity in balance. Have the mind of Christ, and then secondly, we have the power of the Holy Spirit. It's not by your own power, it's not by your own strength, but by the Spirit, says the Lord. Amen? So we can rely on that. And when you combine those inside of us, we become consumed with the very things that consumed Jesus. What was Jesus consumed about? Make sure to follow these rules now. Was that what Jesus was consumed about? No, he usually rebuked the people who said that. He's like, get away from me. I don't, want to de- I don't like you. You're a whitewashed tomb. I don't want your rules. Jesus was consumed about people that were far from God. He was concerned about the drunkards. He was concerned about the prostitutes. And I'm not saying that's all of your friends, okay? Don't walk up to him and say, you drunkard prostitute. You need to go, Jesus, okay? That's not going to work, okay? But we have a responsibility to go. Verse 44, so... Um, Who found Philip? Jesus did, right? Jesus found Philip. But then we read this. Now, Philip from Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter, Philip found Nathanael and said to him, we have found him of whom Moses in the law, as well as the prophets wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. So Jesus found Philip. Philip found Nathanael. Everybody say that with me. Jesus found Philip. Philip found Nathanael, right? Jesus found Philip. Philip found Nathanael. Found people. Find people. Every one of us, if you are here and you're saying, God is doing a work in me, I love him and the transforming he's done in my life, you have a responsibility to share that. Every one of you, whether it's with this church or not. Okay, whatever church, and I've I've, I've talked to some other people here this morning that are from other churches. Praise the Lord, we're glad you're here today. But we have a responsibility to share. Let me ask you this question. Do you know anybody who needs to know Jesus? We had hands up all over the place before. Not even one person, a dozen people. You could probably list a hundred people if you really sat down and did it. And I'm giving you two cards today. Come on. There's a bunch more up here if you need more. But we made these just right so you can fit them right inside your wallet. And if you're talking with somebody, you're talking to the cashier. I've had this happen many times. Hey, how you doing? Talking about a coffee. My wife calls it flirting. I call it evangelizing. There's a fine line, I suppose. I don't know. (laughs) But I'll be talking with them and... (laughs) I have to work through that. Uh, and and you know, I'll invite them to church. 
but I don't really have anything with me. So I'm going to just say, we made these things, so you can just pass them on and say, I'd love for you to come to my church. You can write your phone number on there and say, call me when you're pulling into the parking lot. I'll come out and I'll meet you. You know, do, use this as a tool. Uh, but the most powerful tool is your testimony. What has God done in you? So we're not here to make this life that we live all about us. We're here to make this life about him and what he does. So in a couple of weeks, we're going to finish points three and four. We're going to talk about the how, and we're going to talk about the what else. So if you're really absolutely being driven crazy because you maybe didn't have those notes to fill in, how and what else we're going to get on to. Um, but you are ultimately the best person to help your friends and family connect with Jesus and his church. Not necessarily this church, but his church. You are the best person. They need to hear what you have to say. Our, our world does not want people to hear about the good news that Jesus saves. Our world does not want you to speak out in your work. And I hear people say this, and they'll actually complain about this. Pastor, I don't know what to do. I, I feel so bad at my work because I'm the only Christian there. Hello. You're there on purpose. God puts you there. Don't think that as a bad thing. Think of yourself as a missionary there on purpose. Because this world, every person that you're around desires something more. You understand that? Does anybody remember Atari? Ataris? Yeah, those old gaming systems with the paddles, ding, 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 went back and forth, the ping pong went back and forth, right? Ding, ding, ding. And then we got the new gaming system, the Nintendo. Uh, what was the original one called? I don't remember now. But I remember those little cartridges that you had to put in there, and you'd play Mario Brothers, right? Uh, and I'm not even going to try and sing the song. I had it in my head, or I'm going to mess it up. But, and, then you, and it didn't work, so you took it out, right? You blew in the thing, and you put it back in. You know what I'm talking about? Right? And then the new gaming system came out, and a new one came out, and people keep buying them. In fact, they'll stand in line for hours because they want the latest and greatest. But I'm telling you something this morning. Video games will never fulfill you. But people have a yearning for something more. Anybody here that would be honest and say, when the new phones come out, I kind of like to get the new phones. You're pro- most aren't going to raise their hand, and we've got a, like a half a dozen honest people in church this morning. Uh, and not everybody wants them. But you see this craze in our society, new phone coming out, what do I got to do? I got to get it. Why? Because somehow it's going to make me feel better about myself. I have this need in me. I long for something more. Everybody that you're around, everybody that you know is longing for something more in their life. Many of them just don't know that it's God. He's the only one that can fulfill the longings in our lives when we surrender to him. Our job is to go and introduce them to our Savior. So I, I, take, take those cards that you have. Take those, that post-it that you have. And I pray that you just take this thing and think about, God, who is it that you have for me to share my faith with? Who is it that you have for me to just even just invite to church? And Heavenly Father, I pray that you would create the environments this week in which I can share my faith in which I can talk to people. Father, I pray that you would pour your Holy Spirit on every one of us, that we would have a boldness and a confidence. But one of the things I know this morning is some people say, well, I'm not worthy. I'm not good enough to share. I've done too many things. I've messed up. And one of the things that Jesus offers this morning is a fresh start. He offers a clean heart. And if you're here this morning and you're just like, Pastor, I've got some stuff that I need to confess to God. I need him to take away from my life and he, I need to make him to make me fresh and whole. And if you're here this morning and say, Pastor, would you just pray for me? Help me to be able to grow past my issues that Jesus is forgiving me and to walk in his grace and mercy. If you just be honest, with me, Pastor, just, would you just pray for me? The fresh rededication of my life a fresh cleansing. If you'd be honest this morning, my, for me, both hands are up on this. God, I need your help every day to live a holy life, to live a life that people would look to and see you. Help me to be your hands and feet, Jesus. Help me to live my life so people desire what you have. And help me not keep my mouth shut in a good way, talking about you.
But I also don't want to leave this morning without giving an opportunity because I believe that there's some that are here this morning that God has you here on purpose, not by accident. And he's been drawing on your heart and you know that you've had this sin in your life and you know that you've carried that burden, that weight of sin around and you're sick of it. And today Jesus offers you hope. Today Jesus offers you the ability to lay that down and to walk free. He takes away that stuff. And he gives you a new life. And if you're here this morning, you say, I want this new life that Jesus offers. I want him to forgive my sin and make me a new creation and fulfill the, the, the emptiness of my heart, to fulfill the longing that I've had. If that's you this morning, you say, I need Jesus to be my Savior. If you just raise your hand right now. If you want to ask Jesus into your heart for the first time. Thank you, Lord Jesus. You're even a recommitment today. Thank you, Lord God. God, you are so good. Church, if you'd stand with me. We're going to pray a prayer together. We're going to end with this. My challenge is for you to give these two cards out. If every one of us from both services gave out both cards this week, and even 25% of those people showed up, and even... 5% of them gave their heart to Jesus. Would it be worth it, church? Absolutely it would. There is no limit to what God can accomplish except the limits that you put on Him. And I pray that as a church we take all limits off and we trust Him. But there are those that desire a fresh and new power from God to walk out this life that He has to recommit their lives. And I just pray, ask you to pray this after me. Heavenly Father, thank you for loving me so much that you died for me. And by the power of your Holy Spirit, you were raised back to life. Thank you for giving me that Holy Spirit. Your Holy Spirit. You live inside of me today. Help me not to limit what you can do. Help me live my life to its fullest. Casting off sin and living for you. Help me to never limit you, God. But to believe that you can accomplish anything. Use me, Lord Jesus, in your precious name. Amen. Amen. I believe that when you leave this place, God's not going to let you forget this. I pray that you put those cards in a place that you're going to encounter them every day. I open my wallet multiple times a day, and there they are. That's my reminder that I need to give this to someone. Can we commit to do that this week? Trust God along the way. God bless you. Have a great day.